we have a very distinguished uh, speaker that uh, of uh, great uh, uh, stature, national and international, Dr. Corbin Berger, who is a professor of medicine at the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the Northwestern uh, University in Chicago. Uh, SCP would need the two hours reading, but he asked me to limit it to one minute. I told him I'll make it 40 minutes, but we need to hear it. But he graduated from the University of Indiana, and he went for uh, internal medicine residency at the Barnes Hospital and Washington University in St. Louis, then Allergy Immunology Fellowship at Northwestern, where he continued to be on uh, the faculty all his career there, and uh, he had a wonderful uh, contribution at the university internationally, internationally. He is uh, board certified by three boards, internal medicine, allergy immunology, and diagnostic laboratory immunology, which only a few people will be talking uh, He published more than 300 publications, including original papers, mostly in asthma and comorbid conditions, but almost on the full spectrum of allergen immunology. Uh, he served on uh, several national and international committees. His uh, great value to the NIH, Food Drug Administration, the Joint Council of Allergen Immunology. So uh, he was <coughs> the most respected and popular colleagues in uh, uh, our specialty. I got the great pleasure of sharing with him many meetings and it was tremendously enjoyable both scientifically and socially in there. Uh, with a person of that stature, you think he deserves to put his nose up, but not for the world. Just a gentle, real gentle, humble man in there. Uh, he was a past president of the American Academy of College and Immunology, which was a great great opportunity for me, since at the same time, by chance, I was the president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The two societies were generally looked at as siblings, uh, competitors, uh, rather than siblings rivalry. But during that time, the collaboration between the two organizations because of Dr. Greenberger was wonderful. We enjoyed collaboration and doing for our specialty together, and we achieved things that uh, previous years did not do. I am very, very pleased that he came to us. He's a very busy, sought after speaker. Uh, it took him only 12 hours to come from Chicago to us here yesterday. He arrived at midnight, but already was watching the flights, and uh, I asked for a restaurant to keep open until we come. And I said, he didn't keep him a burger place with that. And when they knew his name, he wanted to give us free meal, but I pressured him. He was a wonderful man, and we're glad he gave us a great talk today and the specialty of pulmonary and allergy, about allergic pulmonary aspergillosis. And now he's given us an update and about the importance of anaphylaxis that we can encounter in the heart. Please welcome with me, Dr. Greenberg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is my, is my voice heard in the back okay? <coughs> Sammy Vaughn and I have something else in common, that is uh, Sammy's fellowship program director, and I did that for many years at Northwestern, so I, I've had a hand in training about 120 fellows in my career, which is one of the nicest things that I've been involved with, to make an impact on others and try to mentor them. So, and Sammy has done that here in making his own impact in his own way, which is so important. Um, so this topic is not meant to be presumptuous. This is a rare condition. It's infrequent, but uh, there's 
uh, a fair statement, and that is that this is an allergic emergency that essentially every physician could face and every healthcare professional could face. So my disclosures, not, not with corporate entities that make drugs, but I'm a consultant for the FD Pulmonary Allergy Drugs Advisory Committee. I review for up to date, and then this is a book royalty. Um, here are the three objectives for this presentation. The first is to improve confidence in quickly making the diagnosis of anaphylaxis so the treatment can be undertaken. And then to appreciate the pathophysiology of anaphylaxis and approaches to treatment, and then to explore the causes or causes of anaphylaxis in the hospital and practice of internal medicine so that a differential diagnosis can be considered. So first, uh, briefly, let's go through this to try to improve confidence in quickly making a diagnosis so the treatment can be undertaken. And uh, as a reminder, uh, since you may not be seeing this all the time, this is a 19-year-old with acute uvular angioedema. We actually don't know why the tongue didn't swell, but the uvula is swollen, and there's, that's enlarged, and that's where the ventilation is, so there's not exactly a lot of room for ventilation in, when somebody has a reaction. This was not from an ACE inhibitor, but ACE inhibitors typically cause allergic reactions uh, through kinin generation um, from the neck up. A patient of mine <clears throat> brought this picture in of her urticaria. She actually didn't have anaphylaxis, but she had urticarial lesions, and I show this because these would be labeled as plaque-like hives. They are elevated. There are a lot of mediators that come out of here, and she's got these hives all over her body. And that typically accompanies people who or occur when people have anaphylaxis. So to come to the definition, there's the NIAID and then the Food Allergy Network definition that is actually a description, but it's, it's actually not a usable definition when they say it's a serious reaction, it's rapid and onset and may cause death, that's a description. But it is a systemic reaction resulting from sudden release of mediators from, from uh, mast cells and basophils, mostly from the mast cells. Um, and it's, there wide, there's a wide range of symptoms and although shock may occur, it most often occurs in the absence of shock or hypoxia or collapse. And quick recognition is critical for successful treatment. We'll come back to this. So this is actually the, the stepwise process for making the diagnosis. And to try to help physicians and healthcare professionals, if we start on the left, it's an acute onset of illness, it says minutes to several hours with involvement of the skin, mucosal tissue, meaning the inside of the mouth, or both, and then they have to have one of two organ systems involved, like respiratory, so acute dyspnea or wheeze, or cardiovascular, where there's a drop in blood pressure. So urticaria plus hypotension is compatible with anaphylaxis. Or, in the middle, two of the following that occur after a likely allergen, so say this is after uh, some trail mix has been eaten, and I, they, say several, they say minutes of several hours. I'd just like to say what I use, um, and that's the rule of twos when I'm thinking about anaphylaxis. It's, the onset is typically within two minutes to two hours when we're talking foods and for nearly all the medications. So two minutes to two hours. Um, there, so there's involvement of the skin, as shown here, and then respiratory, the cardiovascular, or in this one they add in the GI because with, there can be exquisite abdominal pain in anaphylaxis and, and thumbprinting of the bowel if uh, radiologic studies are taken or when they are. So there's ischemic type changes, and that explains the abdominal pain. So please don't write that off or discount it. And then finally on the right, Perhaps you'll see this in the ER, somebody comes in unconscious. There's hypotension after a yellow jacket sting. Person went into shock. So there's a known allergen, and this one is hypotension only. This could also be in, on your floor when somebody gets an IV drug and they go into shock. It could be anaphylactic, and they're showing blood pressure under 90. So this is the, the, the main part on, on making a diagnosis. This is the format. Now, of people who survive anaphylaxis and then see an allergist, this is what Dr. Phil Lieberman in Memphis found. Nearly all had had urticaria, 
some had flushing, and then dyspnea about half or upper airway swelling, hypotension a third, and some people had abdominal pain. This would, these are on survivors of anaphylaxis. So with that, hopefully knowing what it is, um, let's now turn to pathophys of anaphylaxis and approaches to treatment for the next part. And I want to share with you a, a landmark study. This is of uh, anesthesia and anaphylaxis by Fisher, published 1986. They had 205 patients with cardiovascular manifestations of anaphylactic shock. And I, I will point out to you that the coronary arteries, the large, the large coronary arteries have mast cells in the adventitia interstitium. And the mediators that we'll talk about are released. So people can have uh, arrhythmias, angina, hypotension, MIs during anaphylaxis through the mast cell activation. Um, in this paper, in this series, Systolic blood pressure was, was under 50. That was the sole manifestation in three patients. Some people had unrecordable BP in 83 patients. CVP was low in all 36 people that didn't have cardiac disease. And the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure was low in three. So it's on the fourth bullet point, in 11 patients who had cardiac disease, the CVP was elevated in nine and low in two but they still had to give volume um, to help stabilize because people third space to a huge extent during anaphylaxis and need intravascular fluids. And perhaps one of the key points is what the quotation is here. In the six patients that had catheters in place, the pulmonary artery pressure increased and then fell over 10 minutes. So with bronchoconstriction, pulmonary hypertension occurring in the same setting of shock and very low CVPs. They estimated plasma losses up to 35%. So emergencies, right ventricular, uh, the pressure on the right side of the heart can go up, at least initially. At the same time, there's no CVP, basically. Um, the patterns of anaphylaxis are shown here. Most of the reactions are, are uniphasic, and that's the immediate reaction and then there's a surge and an event. A few people have a biphasic reaction where there's the initial event, improvement, and then another surge of anaphylaxis like urticaria and hypotension four hours later. A few people have something that's labeled the protracted response where the, everything continues, urticaria, hypotension, bronchoconstriction. It can go on for 36 hours. So simplistically, the uniphasic is this the antigen exposure, the initial symptoms, treatment, and it resolves. The biphasic is shown in this part of the slide. Here's symptoms. These are showing mast cells. There's an asymptomatic period, and then there's a return and treatments needed. I happen to be part of the practice parameters uh, for anaphylaxis, and they actually made a case for this, that the biphasic would actually be something that comes back in its short as 30 minutes, and then you, have a, you can have it up to 72 hours. Rarely there's this pattern protracted, as the name sounds, and you're treating the patient in the unit, um, urticaria, angioedema, hypotension, or bronchoconstriction, all lasting, say here, up to 32 hours. And I, I work with the medical examiner's office in Chicago, in Cook County. Uh, one of the doctors I knew well and had done some studies on deaths from asthma, but this was a study on deaths from anaphylaxis, and that's the point here. Half the deaths occurred within the first 60 minutes. So we had lay investigators go out. When there's a death, they look for foul play. That's their job, but when there's, there's a me medical cause, I had a checklist that they used, and we had permission from our IRB to call surviving family members or kin. And, we came up with about half the people died within 60 minutes. So fast moving fatalities. In England, the, Dr. Pumphrey published that the median time to respiratory or cardiac arrest was what he called iatrogenic, so systemically administered within five minutes, and then 15 minutes for stings and 30 minutes for food. So rapidly progression, rapid progression on the fatal attacks. What's known about 
factors that can make this condition or this reaction even worse. Fortunately, there's been a lot of scientific studies uh, in anaphylaxis, even though we don't have controlled studies of treatment. For example, baseline plasma histamine higher, making anaphylaxis worse or more difficult. Increased baseline tryptase, which I'll talk about. This, the third point, there's reduced level of platelet activating factor acetyl hydrol hydrol hydrolase. This is the enzyme that breaks down platelet activating factor. Years ago, I had the chance to do some studies with platelet activating factor. It's a, it constricts smooth muscle, as does prostaglandin D2 or leukotriene D4, and can cause bronchoconstriction, it can cause smooth muscle permeability, uh, relaxation, so you get permeability changes. So here it is that the acetyl hydrolase that breaks it down is low. Um, and, then, and then in terms of oropharyngeal swelling, reduced levels of ACE itself lead to increased bradykinin, which can cause the oropharyngeal swelling. So these have been identified in studies making anaphylaxis more difficult to control or worse. And then on a large picture, the comorbidities, like people taking multiple meds for hypertension associated with more severe anaphylaxis, CHF, severe asthma as compared to mild asthma, depression, and then indolent systemic mastocytosis. Medications themselves have to be uh, taken into consideration. I'm going to talk about beta blockers. They're not as bad as people make them out to be. Same thing with ACE inhibitors. Uh, tricyclics can be medicines that have H1 antihistamine effects. Um, they can also increase adrenergic tone. And MAO inhibitors could present a situation where epinephrine should not be administered, or if one would have that combination of a person getting an MAO inhibitor and they have anaphylactic shock they, where they would need epi, like a small dose could be given and then watching blood pressure, for example. So we have the the measurements at the top part of this slide and then the comorbidities or the medications that all could make anaphylaxis worse or at least uh, make it difficult to control. Now I'm going to diverge and go to some basic information here about the mast cell itself. And that is there are mediators that participate in anaphylaxis. And on the left, the pre-4 mediators a major one, but not the only one, is histamine. If I inhale histamine, as I have done in studies, my airways could constrict. If I get it IV, I could have flushing, paritis, urticaria, and then I could have drop in blood pressure, and my, I could have abdominal pain. Heparin is preformed, but we don't understand the role, if any, that it has an anaphylaxis, because this is complex. And the protease tryptase is, may have a physiologic function, but it's not understood well, but at least this is used as a marker of the condition itself. De novo synthesis, PGD2, leukotriene D4, platelet activating factor, all can cause bronchoconstriction, can cause smooth muscle changes. TNF is, is released, but this doesn't seem to have a role in the, in the anaphylaxis itself. But if you put this together, the mast cell activation and then what I told you earlier, we land up with hypovolemic shock with increased pulmonary artery pressure and bronchoconstriction and the plasma volume losses, 35, up to 35%, cardiac arrhythmias and ischemia. So the mast cell activation contributing to the full-blown uh, syndrome of anaphylaxis. And I'd like to do a few things with questions. And this is not just for allergy fellows, but there's a cytokine that makes mast cells grow and differentiate. Does anybody want to help me out on that one? Very good, stem cell factor. Okay, so that's too easy, maybe. Um, it in which is its membrane receptor? C-kit, and so this is all understood now. It turns out CD117 is the, the designation for C-kit. It, it's an intrinsic tyrosine kinase, and Oncologists are well aware of this. Um, it's activated when it's cross-linked. And, and mutation in particular occurs in indolent systemic mastocytosis that upregulates it. So it actually is autophosphorylated, and then the process is on high. 
Um, there are a couple well-known acquired molecular defects causing mast cell proliferation. This one is the, the one that's the allergist, immunologist is going to be thinking about it, and the hematologist that's doing the bone marrow. Uh, is there point mutation D816V? It's a gain of function mutation that occurs in 90 some percent of people with indolent systemic mastocytosis. This test is available in peripheral blood as well, but it's not quite as sensitive. The other um, molecular defect occurs in leukemia, and this one is the FIP1-like platelet-derived growth factor receptor. This is associated with chronic eosinophilic leukemia. So that was information leading up to indolent systemic mastocytosis. In the past, it was called mastocytosis, then systemic mastocytosis. Now it's referred to as indolent systemic mastocytosis. This is a clonal, this is a disorder of flushing and hypotension with clonal proliferation of mast cells. The baseline tryptase is over 20 nanograms per mil. For uh, adults, and when you order the test, the normal is up to 11.4. So these patients, even when they have no symptoms, have elevated amounts of tryptase. Lesions can look like this, the salmon-colored macules, for example, and the bone marrow is characterized as shown in the lower part here by clumps, aggregates of these tryptase positive mast cells that are staining with brown, and they're abnormal CD5 25 cells. There's another condition called monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome where the, there are plenty of tryptase positive spindle cells, but they don't have the clumps, so they don't have mastocytosis, but they have elevated tryptase and, and an abnormal bone marrow. This is I show this because the understanding of mast cells has increased uh, remarkably, and, and the, there's, there are international studies on, for mastocytosis as well. So some of the conditions here, indolent systemic mastocytosis, then the monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome, another term, mast cell activation syndrome, and then something I've studied over the years, idiopathic anaphylaxis. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. So to touch on this, mast cell activation syndrome, the patients have allergic type symptoms, urticaria, flushing, pruritus, headache, cramping, vomiting, respiratory symptoms, hypotension. They have to have increases in the serum tryptase. They can also have increase in other mediators, and then they have to respond to H1 blockers, for example. Uh, these patients don't have anaphylaxis all the time. That's why it's differentiated from idiopathic anaphylaxis. So at this point, I'm going to switch gears and talk about an IgE-mediated reaction, and we have our warm-up in our weather. Um, so we're going to talk about hymenoptera, or stinging insects. This was uh, in the newspaper where uh, there was a timer and they had a volunteer and they covered the, uh, the volunteer with something uh, honeybees like and they saw how long it took to get the body covered. And you see the, the, the honeybees are still in the air here. Here's the person when some of these were coming off. Here's the judges. Um, so we're talking about IgE mediated reaction. Um, I don't recommend this. I don't think this was IRB approved. but uh, this. Uh, it's said, but um, this leads me to measurements of histamine and tryptase. So you could be seeing a patient in the unit or in the ER, and there's an anaphylaxis. And uh, from a study where deliberate stings were done, these were done at Hopkins and at Mayo primarily with IRB approval um, in the time when venom immunotherapy was being studied. They needed a positive, they needed to really check for success, so they had permission to do deliberate stings with intraarterial catheters in, IVs in, um, and in the ICU. They nearly lost some patients doing this, by the way. Here's the tryptase on the y-axis, and the, I noticed that the coordinates are different. The scales are different on both of these, I point out. The histamine goes up immediately and then it comes down because of, but notice what this tryptase is doing. Anything over 11 is ill elevated, so it's almost immediately elevated, goes up to 60 or 70, and then even at four hours, it's high here. 
And on this patient, the sting occurs, there's an immediate increase in the tryptase and histamine. The tryptase dropped a little bit, but still very high, and then a longer period where it, even at six hours, if you obtained it, it would be elevated. So there's immediate uh, release of, of histamine, and then what's practically a test you can order is tryptase along the way to help confirm the reaction. So to explain what might be what, what's known about hymenoptera anaphylaxis, avoidance measures are recommended, like people uh, may have to give up golf until they're on their immunotherapy or something. Um, we want to exclude indolent systemic mastocytosis, so baseline tryptase should be checked. Patients need epinephrine. They need to know when to do it. They absolutely need to see an allergist immunologist because besides the avoidance measures and securing the diagnosis, allergen immunotherapy with hymenoptera, with yellow jacket, for example, hornets, wasp, and honeybee is extremely effective and quite safe. It's a four to five year course for most people. And I serve on the pharmacy committee at Northwestern and we always are calculating our number needed to treat. The number needed to treat is only two for adults with this condition, which is remarkably low, which is great. If the adult who has IgE antibodies to yellow jacket, let's say, and has had a history for, for anaphylaxis from the sting, there's at least a 60% chance of a subsequent anaphylactic reaction. This drops to 3%, so that gives you number needed to treat of only two. And for children, there's about a 20% risk of a repeat anaphylactic reaction. This is reduced, so that comes out to be a number needed to treat of six. So can't get much better than that in terms of treatment, and it is a safe treatment. And this gave investigators the opportunity to determine whether beta blockers might increase the number of anaphylactic reactions people had when they're getting immunotherapy, because one could suggest beta blockers will cause more severe reactions or more frequent reactions because of beta blockade. And in fact, that was not the case. And this is an example of a study published 10 years ago with beta blockade, the, the number of uh, what are called systemic side effects was not increased by beta blockers. And this is something that actually we found in a study of contrast material, of people that were not known to be allergic to contrast material. We explored whether beta blockers would increase the risk of reactions, and it didn't. Um, although people want to think differently, but that's not what data showed. And more recently, uh, with ACE inhibitors, people proposed that these might make it worse. Well, the study data do not provide evidence that ACE inhibitors increase the rate of venom immunotherapy systemic reactions, supporting the continued use of these valuable and hard to replace substances throughout immunotherapy. So there are other controllers for our, for our blood vessel and our, our tone, our sympathetic tone, but the, the beta blockers and the ACE inhibitors could be continued in these patients. One more question before I leave this subject. If I am allergic to honeybees, can I eat honey? People are allergic to phospholipase and hyaluronidase and what have you in the venom, but the answer is yes. So you can eat honey because that doesn't contain the, the um, proteins that people get allergic to. So now let me turn uh, to causes of anaphylaxis in the hospital and the practice of internal medicine so that a differential diagnosis can be considered. I'm first going to talk about food allergy. Um, it is a growing problem. This is for real. And you have an expert here um, on food allergies and anaphylaxis. Um, and he's well known as an expert in clinical research and assessment. And if you have not heard Sammy Bonner give a lecture. He's an outstanding teacher as well. So peanut allergy prevalence in the U.S. This is in children not selected for any particular disease. So at first it was 0.4% by a self-report by telephone, so this is not confirmed. This is not proving that there's IgE antibody present. But it went up by 2008, and then 2010, 2%. Again, not selected for any disease. This is with serum antibodies to peanut of a high number and self-prescribed epinephrine. So it, it is accepted that food allergy prevalence is going up. 
but we have to certainly point out that not everything that a patient says is allergic is allergic. For example, there are a lot of adverse food reactions that have nothing to do with IgE, but a person will designate them to themselves as allergic. Uh, here are some of them under toxic bacterial food poisoning or heavy metal poisoning or scromboid poisoning. This is this is generation by bacteria of, of histamine from histidine in the bacteria. This is spoiled food or improperly contained or uh, preserved fish, say in a restaurant, and then people have anaphylactic reactions. But this is not recurrent anaphylaxis, but it's an acute reaction. Caffeine, alcohol, histamine in foods. And then non-toxic, of course, lactose deficiency, pancreatic insufficiency, malabsorption of carbohydrates, anorexia, what have you. So all, all this may be called allergy when it isn't. But in this study, they went from self-report, these reports, to something trying to prove it. But I would want to point out that when people are uh, given the opportunity to report food allergy on the internet, uh, Dr. Ruchi Gupta, who's at Northwestern, found as high as 8% of the people claim that they're allergic to foods, and they had severe reactions to multiple foods. But there's a bias here, and these aren't proven. But the prevalence was highest for peanut, followed by milk and shellfish. And then what's in yellow here shows the main uh, fish, uh, f foods that are resultant, that can result in anaphylaxis. Various types of fish, shellfish, peanut, which is in the legume family, tree nuts, milk, egg, wheat, and soy. There are others, but these are the main ones. And I want to share with you what was in the New England Journal that really has caused a lot of excitement in the field of allergy immunology, and that is uh, the results from prospective study. And that would be of, of high-risk children, would early introduction of peanut actually be protective? This is not intuitive, but a, a clinic, this is an example, though, where an observational study was reported about 10 years ago, and then this led to a prospective study. And the prospective study confirmed the observational study. I think in medicine, we know many times that our observational studies might be tantalizing, and when the hypothesis is put to test in a prospective study, it bombs and then we have to say, try to explain it. This is an example where it actually, the prospect of study confirmed the uh, observational study. The observation was that uh, this was looking at peanut allergy uh, prevalence in Israel where peanut products are given to infants at four months, five, six months, in other words, early on, versus Jewish children in London who were living under the rules that came from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Allergy, and that is strict avoidance of peanuts in allergenic foods for the first three years of life. There, there was over 50-fold difference in prevalence between peanut allergy in England, which was far higher than it was in children, uh, in infants in Israel. So this study actually put this to test. If they introduce peanut in high-risk infants, and Sam, Sammy Bonham would be an expert in this if, it's, if you have a, a child or grandchild where this may be applicable. The inclusion criteria would be children who had to have eczema, egg allergy, or both. So this is, these are high-risk children who are, are at risk for getting peanut allergy. And then there was the intervention of a snack. They had peanut butter and corn. This is Bamba that is sold in the U.S. This is what they, they, uh, the, children, the infants get early on. This is the only slide I'm showing from this study, but in the intention to treat analysis, the prevalence of peanut, prevalence of allergy over time in the avoidance group, 13.7%, but look at this in the consumption group, about one, almost one-tenth as much. These were in children that did not have antibodies to peanut at the time. So quite interesting. And then of the children that already were sensitized, meaning they had <coughs> IgE antibodies to peanut, the, the avoidance group, one-third of them went, or 35% went on to get peanut allergy as would be expected. But in the consumption group, it was, it was reduced greatly, and it was 10%. So here, I'd say this is quite exciting, 
Um, it's not a cure, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction, and it's an example where the, the sort of counterintuitive um, steps were successful. This could be a lecture in itself, but I, I want to share this with you because it it's, has the uh, opportunity to change really how we're doing things. Now, what can you take home from this part of the talk? This is what I call food allergy pearls about nuts uh, from the literature, and that is, if you're asked this, the percent of tree nut allergy in people with peanut allergy is 35 to 50 percent. So anticipate this. If you're seeing somebody with walnut or hazelnut allergy, um, the percent of children and adolescents with peanut allergy who by the time they're going to college still have the allergy is 80 percent, but 20 percent outgrow it. And I've showed you the ones, the high-risk children, but it's about one-fifth of those children who have, have um, the children and adolescents may actually lose the peanut allergy. It's not the, so favorable with tree nut allergy where they retain the allergy a long time. And what is also known is that as the age goes up, the eliciting dose of the allergen that is required to cause the food allergic reaction decreases. So for those of us in internal medicine, we have our patients that have long established nut allergy, let's say, the dosage needed is very low. And then the percent of children with food allergies who outgrow it by school age can be as high for milk. It, it was initially reported to be about two-thirds for eggs, but now I saw a paper with a much lower rate of, re, of remission on that, soy about half. So there is some natural loss over time. And if a child is allergic to eggs, for example, the history is often scrambled eggs or French toast cause the allergic reaction. In terms of what's known is about 70% of these children tolerate baked eggs, meaning it's heated at 400 degrees when it's baked, or in waffles, that's labeled extensively heated eggs. And on the third bullet point, egg white, Ovalbumin, it thermally denatures with the heat, but ovomucoid, another allergen, doesn't. So people have learned over time that the, it may, ex explains where the IgE is directed at. And, and you may take a history that somebody is eating a muffin fine, no symptoms, but if they eat scrambled eggs, they have anaphylaxis. So this is, I've shared this with you because the history is not incompatible with egg allergy here. And the allergist can help you sort this thing out. So now let's move on. The question's often asked, is there an effect of atopy on anaphylaxis? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, for those of us in the hospital, no for penicillin, uh, no for muscle relaxants, hymenopter stings, and insulin. This is a very rare condition. Um, but yes, for foods, for latex, contrast material, if they have asthma, especially severe asthma, idiopathic anaphylaxis, and then a condition called exercise-induced anaphylaxis. And I like to go over differential diagnosis. How would you describe the urticarial lesions that accompany carcinoid syndrome? Because often in patients who have anaphylaxis, the workup for carcinoid is carried out. Anybody want to tell me what the hives, or whether you get hives in carcinoid? You don't. Okay, same thing. The workup for pheo is carried out. You don't get hives with VO. Scromboid poisoning, you, you do get hives with, but the first two are not, they're, say the lab tests are done, but the patient, if you have urticaria in a patient, you're not getting it. And another condition where we, we almost never get urticaria is this one. This is disfiguring angioedema. You can see the, the lips. This is, these are pictures I took from New England Journal. Um, Imagine if this were in the, in the back of the throat and oral pharynx. This is hereditary angioedema. This is not anaphylaxis, but it is a life endangering condition. So there's a single test that is ordered to rule this one out. The allergy fellows have been hitting the nail on the head. You want to help on this one? That's the test. You don't need CH50, C3, C4. The C4 should be low really low in this condition. This doesn't have to do with anaphylaxis, but you might see a patient with this emergency. 
So let me return to this. This is the most recent classification scheme for anaphylaxis. Um, immunologic meaning IgE, and then non-IgE non types. This can be from dextran, or I'm going to talk about contaminants and heparin, and then non-immunologic exercise and idiopathic. So one of the subjects of, uh, that cuts across a lot of areas within medicine has to do with a relatively new cause for anaphylaxis, alpha-gal, or galactose, alpha-1,3-galactose. This combines areas of tick bites, meat, beef, pork, and lamb, for example, and chemotherapy. Sort of amazing how this has come to be. And it also includes blood group antigen B because galactose, alpha-1 galactose, is almost, it's structurally very close to blood group antigen B. So how does this come to be? The first observation was there was anaphylaxis from chemotherapy um, for, with cetuximab, and, and what it's known is that for some reason the monoclonal antibody was prepared not in Chinese hamster ovary cells, but in a mouse cell line, SP20, that had a gene called a alpha-1,3 galactosyl transferase, which put this sugar on the immunoglobulin. When the company was asked subsequently to make this monoclonal antibody in Chinese hamster ovary cells, they made the same antibody, it didn't cause any um, there was no anaphylaxis or no IgE to it. We have antibodies against alpha-gal, and this is a major antigen preventing like xenotransplant success. And in particular, here's an immunoglobulin, and I have some arrows to where the immunoglobulin, cetuximab, got, actually turned into a, more of an allergen because it, of the oligosaccharide on it. So we don't expect this to, to happen in this way, but it did because of the, the cell line that was used to make the antibodies. Another part of this story is the tick, where in the intestine of the tick, there is this, there's alpha-gal. So when, if a person gets chiggers or bitten by ticks, they could be, that's the delivery of the potential allergen and then IgE antibodies are made. So what's happened is there's a glycosylation of the FAB or FC part of the immunoglobulin or the tick bite sensitize the patient in the field. And the connection was that there's delayed type of urticaria and occasionally anaphylaxis. I gave you the rule of twos earlier, but this is three to six hours later. The patient can tolerate chicken, turkey, or fish, and we would want to know if they're tick bites. This is sort of an unbelievable intersection of events that led to investigators, primarily at Charlottesville, Virginia, to work this out. There is an assay available. Now let me turn to another area that's, that is, is, has teaching points, and that has to do with a non-IgE reaction. And this has to do with an unsuspected cause of anaphylaxis. It was first identified in patients undergoing hemo hemodialysis in St. Louis. Heparin was suspected, whereas heparin's almost never a cause of anaphylaxis. Heparin comes from outside the U.S. like many drugs. Baxter, which is in the Chicago area, will get the heparin that comes, if you call from intestine of of pigs, for example. They had used the same supplier for three years. It turned out the heparin was adulterated. And at the same time, I'm not the investigator, but the, the, you will recall with the swine flu epidemic in China, they slaughtered probably tens of thousands of swine to try to reduce the um, spread of swine flu in China. So the price of, chi of swine went up, and that's where the heparin came from. So mischievous actions then occurred. And this resulted in anaphylaxis in the hemodialysis patients. And studies were carried out to work on the mechanism. And in this, the, the mechanism is not IgE, but I mentioned bradykinin earlier, but calicrine gets converted to bradykinin, and they were able to show what control heparin did. These are different dosages, um, but the calicrine activity went up with this heparin that was adulterated. So heparin should not say this, the heparin, it's the, control was showing this, there shouldn't be much calicrine activation at all. And they also found that C5A was identified with this over-sulfated chondroitin sulfate in unfractionated heparin compared to the controlled unfractionated heparin. So we've got mediators C5A, which can cause mast cells to be activated, and calicrine, which would generate into bradykinin that can cause shock. So this was um, 
adulterated heparin. And I, I did find out that the, um, you know, we have in our improvement in our, our expectations as physicians, we're going to participate in improving the system and system-wide practice. What happened over there is the company wasn't penalized. Um, Baxter stopped using the that company to get the heparin from, but the uh, there's a regulator, like an FDA regulator in China, who's, who talked and released the information about what happened. This is as much as I can tell from news, and I talked to somebody at FDA about it, and they, that person lost her life. She was killed. The regulator, because she spoke about this, that's a far cry from all of us making changes, even little ones, that try to improve the health care of our patients in our systems here. Now let me turn to idiopathic anaphylaxis. This is anaphylaxis not explained by approved or presumptive cause, and you have to know enough about these other conditions, food, meds, exercise, food and exercise, stings, mastocytosis, C1 inhibitor dysfunction. I mentioned a number of these. There's mast cell activation. Tryptase goes up acutely, but not doesn't stay up. Urine histamine, we've measured, that goes up. B cells are activated. Complements normal skin tests to allergens are not informative. And this, we found out, was response, a condition responsive to prednisone. Patients didn't need to be on prednisone indefinitely, but it was a steroid responsive condition that could reduce the severity and frequency of attacks. We designate, we classified anaphylaxis as shown here, either generalized, meaning idiopathic anaphylaxis with urticary angioedema, and then respiratory or hypotension or angioedema where it was urticary and upper airway obstruction. And sometimes this is the situation. You're not sure. The person gives a good history, but you don't have the evidence. Um, and then you just can call it questionable until you get some objective evidence. For example, a person <coughs> reports syncope, but you're not quite convinced they actually were in shock. Um, these patients are allergic. Some of them have food allergies or food anaphylaxis. They may have uh, pre-existing urticary angioedema, but now they have anaphylaxis. So it can coexist with other conditions. Sometimes there's panic attack or there's depression or something because the anaphylaxis is so disruptive to the patient's life. We do have to think of these other conditions as I've shown at the bottom. So in any case of anaphylaxis, there is a risk of death. We need to have self-injectable epinephrine. H1 blockers for this condition. At one time, we were giving oral albuterol to increase cyclic AMP, and then a three-month trial of prednisone. And sometimes things just didn't work out. We did all our best. We ruled out the conditions, and the patient had a lot of symptoms. And this led us to identifying what's shown at the bottom, undifferentiated somatoform idiopathic anaphylaxis. They don't have objective evidence for anaphylaxis. They may have been in the ER a lot, they may have strider, they may present with strider, or they might have syncope, but they, if you can get someone to take their blood pressure, the blood pressure is normal. And this was published 20 years ago when prednisone increases the number of attacks, like in the first week or something. When you can't confirm objective evidence, when there's no response to therapy, when the patient meets criteria for somatoform disorder, and then patients typically don't even appreciate that they have a psychiatric condition, they won't get care. Um, they have to have one or more physical complaints. The exam doesn't confirm the objective evidence. And the key part is number two, symptoms or the impairment or the physical problem are grossly out of proportion to the physical exam. I know Sammy could help with this. He's published on Munchausen's and other areas mimicking anaphylaxis. This is called somatoform condition like they have normal blood pressure when they're passed out. <clears throat> so within idiopathic anaphylaxis, I want to say that we have to consider and exclude other causes, being aware of new observations, knowing the patient and disease. And at Northwestern, I'm going to show you what over time we've done to exclude other causes of anaphylaxis. Because it might be said, well, the person has anaphylaxis, you just didn't look hard enough to find the cause. The people with idiopathic anaphylaxis wake up at four in the morning, they've been asleep for six hours or more, they're covered with hives, they have abdominal pain, they have to go into the bathroom because they have to have, uh, they'll have a diarrhea stool, and the next thing is they're passing out and they are in shock. 
So they have something not related to foods or meds, um, but we look for hidden foods. Um, maybe there's a non-reported medicine. I've seen anaphylaxis from bee pollen, from Whole Foods, um, where people take pollen and put it in their smoothie, and we published a patient with that. In fact, she, we were able to show that the pollen contained ragweed, grass pollen, trees, and alternaria, which is a mold that she ate and caused anaphylaxis. Um, monosodium glutamate, we've studied that one. Aspartame, we've studied. Those are both in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Papain, and in the past, but occasionally it raises its head. Potassium metabisulfite. Um, this was the protocol we used, and we could never prove anybody actually had something allergic to that one. And notice what we did in this one. We, their first dose was a milligram, then we gave a placebo uh, in our challenge. But patients, um, this, this is for a number, from a number of years ago, but occasionally this still comes up. Now, turning to treatment, I mentioned people need to have their epinephrine. They come as dual packs. Um, and this is based on sort of the NIAID report and, and a compilation of studies where this shows you the percent of patients that needed two epinephrine dosages, and it's, it's not a small number. It ranges from 36 percent, most recent study 33. Often that's one, ep, one injection of anaphylaxis in the field, and then one in the ER. The allergy team here can show you these if you haven't seen them. This is one brand epinephrine. It comes as point. 1.5 milligrams or 0 0.30 milligrams. The cap comes off. The person has to have the confidence to use it, take the cap off. They have a sweeping motion and put it in the vastus lateralis and hold it for 10 seconds. And then they'll never see a needle. Then they need to get help. This is a newer product, AviQ. The cap comes off. This one talks to you. They put this on their leg and it gives a countdown and delivers the medicine. Again, no needle involved. There's one other product, AdrenaClick, um, that's out there as well. Taking a look at anaphylaxis, one of the important points about it is that often patients don't get epinephrine in time. We and others have found this in patients who die from anaphylaxis. It's almost always the case. Uh, um, and that, not that epinephrine will prevent a death in every patient. But Estelle Simons from Winnipeg has explored causes for why people didn't use their auto in injector. And this is where an allergy immunology consult can be helpful. For those of you who have patients um, that have EpiPens or AviQs or what have you, the patient needs to really know exactly when they're going to do it and when they need to do it. Often patients don't want to give the injection because they don't want to go to the emergency room. They're busy. They're going to take 200 milligrams of diphenhydramine as they have before and wait it out. And they may have lucked out that they, the attack went away on its own. That's not, good, that's not a good plan. But the other is there, people may be unsure when to use it. So we really have to say that if somebody has a known history, say of idiopathic anaphylaxis or a patient who's stung by a yellow jacket or has a food reaction, what I preach is this, as soon as there's evidence for mast cell activation, like turning red all over, starting to itch all over, and getting some welts, they have to take action. If they take diphenhydramine or they take cetirizine, um, cetirizine starts working before diphenhydramine. That's not, that's only against one mediator, it takes way too long to work. So epinephrine remains the drug of choice. The patients need to really know when to inject and they do need to get help. So in this talk, as I conclude, I've tried to make everyone familiar enough to have the confidence so when you see it, you can diagnose it quickly. It is an emergency. Things can move very fast downhill. To appreciate what's known about path pathophys and our understanding of what makes some of the reactions more difficult to overcome. And then I've shared with you some of the, the information about various causes that really covers virtually every field within um, internal medicine as far as I'm concerned. So I appreciate being here, and I'd be happy to take any questions.
until there are any questions. Can somebody put the lights on, please? How many of you have seen, <coughs> how many of you have been face to face with someone having anaphylaxis? Where things are changing on you quickly. So about four. So it's, it's often around 10% of physicians. So, so wherever you are, it, it can happen in this, uh, hopefully this is something you feel more confident with getting help. Yeah. Paul, until we get to other questions, I would like to oh. express our appreciation for your professorship. Thank you, chip thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's a, my pleasure to be it's here. Thank you. You're very, this, very gracious. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keith. Yeah, Keith. Question. Dr. Fain. In anaphylaxis, you should almost always expect a skin manifestation. Yes, except in the people going into shock. So the IV's hanging and they're dropping into shock. That could be that could be anaphylaxis, especially if they're known to be allergic to it. Or the, the, the outpatient example, or really the ER example is uh, sting insects. People just are found unconscious. They have no hives. They're in shock. They get immediate care, and they start to get resuscitated. When their blood pressure comes up, uh, urticaria, uh, urticaria appears. And then somebody thinks of anaphylaxis. This, that's, a, that's not a rare story. Can the patient use expired auto-injector epinephrine? Uh, well, there's a paper on that recently. So the answer is yes. It, what is the technically no, but like what's better than if they don't have any epinephrine, there's actually even a year old epi, there is maybe 50% of the epi in there. So I would say based on the paper, I think you're talking about the answer is yes. I mean, what, what is your position on that? That's it. Yeah. Okay, Do but they, the, they should. It may not, be less effective, particularly if it was in a warm climate. No. Yeah. How frequent can a person repeat the epinephrine? Okay, the, the practice parameters say every five minutes. So this is an IM injection. Say somebody, let's say they a bee sting allergic person or um, food allergy person, and there is a reaction, anaphylaxis, they could repeat it. But they've got to get help and call for help. I had, I had a patient a number of years ago, he was 19 years old, college student, and, and he was home for break in October. He was in a bar, and he, got, he was known to be allergic to peanuts, and he was accepted a dare to eat a peanut, all right? And he came into the emergency room, so I was on call then, tight bronchoconstriction. There was no, they, they almost, when they intubated him, they almost, Keith, they, they, they almost couldn't deliver him with that, whatever, they couldn't get any ventilation into him. But he did survive it. His pH was, was 6.9 something, and his PCO2 was as high as you can measure. But he did survive it. But he, he barely, but he was one who never got epinephrine, um, but he took it there. So I didn't really mention some populations, but like some, some people just deny the risks or the severity of the anaphylaxis. But, uh, those are tough ones, and that, that was nearly fatal. One less, okay. You know, Dr. I'm, I'm always struck by the penalty that we pay for leaving, living in a society where we're almost too clean. I mean, there was, there was a paper about asthma, the, the incidence of asthma apparently being a little less in people that were raised on a farm or around right. animals and things like that, and, and this peanut thing is reminiscent to me of something like that. Is it possible? that we are sterilizing our environment and being too cautious and that we should get down in the dirt a little more than we are. Uh, this, maybe Dr. Bono will invite me back if you want to hear about this, but this is on origins of allergy, allergic diseases which have, have gone up. And this, was, this is, uh, led to what's called the hygiene hypothesis because there was, in terms of hay fever, in the families that had a lot of children, the oldest children were more likely to be allergic in the eight children later, they're less likely to be allergic and that led, well, maybe more viruses, maybe there's something protective in some of the viruses and this have you. And it, as far as I'm concerned, most of that's fallen apart, but it's got a way, people got to think about it for Th2 type of lymphs versus Th1 um, cells. But is, are we, the, the um, I don't think, I think that I'm intrigued with the, the New England Journal paper on, you know, empiric treatment of these highly allergic children with peanut, there's some risk with it. But I, I, don't, I think there's a lot of, uh, regarding asthma, it was the children that, that got viruses early on 
and were, like if they were sneezed on or they, were, they got vi cold virus, they were, they, we know that's a risk factor for asthma. So I, I, don't, I don't think, I say I think the hygiene hypothesis is not, not really serving us at this point. Viruses cause a lot of infections, rhinovirus in high-risk children, for example, causes it. So I could go on, there's, there's, it's, a, it's um, an interesting way to think about things. But I'm intrigued with the peanuts. I mean, Sammy, what do you think on the peanut paper? No recording, I'll say my opinion. Our organizations are in working on a statement, position statement. And there's a lot of difficulties in writing this so far. Uh, because it's a remarkable shift from the person the child cannot get allergy to something not exposed to until the gastrointestinal tract histologically and enzymatically and immunologically matures. But this shows early introduction can build tolerance. Of course, we, we, to build tolerance, we have to be exposed to something. How much and at what age we can do that in experimental animals because we're well controlled, but we cannot know it in human beings. So, so far I'm of the conservative party of delayed introduction of, uh, of this, but it's still a gray area. Science cannot be done by one study, although it is a very good study. It was done with respected colleagues and that. But science has to come after a big shaped curve and you see where are the results are going. And that not just one uh, shift. But regarding the, the uh, dirt, I still, uh, my prayer is our Heavenly Father, give us our daily germs. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah,